I'm very grateful to the Association of Anesthetists for the opportunity to participate in this webinar. When I received the invitation, I found the title somewhat intriguing. It's clearly designed to be provocative, but it also reflects the fact, I think, that the rise in popularity of fascial pain blocks has somewhat polarized our community. The erector spinae plane or ESP block does seem to have been largely responsible for triggering the controversy and debate that surrounds fascial plane blocks. The TAP and PEX blocks have been around longer, but they never engendered a debate about whether they were friend or foe. So why has the ESP block provided this rather antagonistic reaction? One reason may have to do with its tremendous popularity and explosive growth, which tends to polarize people into enthusiasts versus skeptics or naysayers. But more importantly, I think that this is what innovation looks like. It's disruptive, and disruption leads to controversy. I think that one of the things that the ESP block has done is that it has challenged the status quo in our current worldview with regard to regional anesthesia. What exactly do I mean by this? Well, for one, it requires us to accept that there is a permeable or porous barrier between the erector spinae plane and the paravertebral space to which local anesthetic can travel. And the second belief that we have to grapple with is that meaningful analgesia can be achieved without dense or even detectable cutaneous sensory block. And to accept this, we've had to rediscover the foundations of knowledge that underpin this new worldview. Now, in trying to understand the ESP block myself, these are the facts that I have personally learned and currently believe in. First, that the intertranscious connective tissue complex is indeed a permeable structure woven of collagen fibers. The dorsal rami and accompanying blood vessels pierce this, and the tunnels through which they travel are a major pathway for local anesthetic spread. Local anesthetic that follows the dorsal rami reaches the areas of the dorsal root ganglion and the spinal nerves in the paravertebral space around the intervertebral foramen. Now note that this is distinct from the ventral rami being located upstream or proximal to it. And thus lack of ventral rami staining as documented in some cadaveric studies does not necessarily exclude blockade of sensory afferents from the intercostal nerves and torso because these will pass through the dorsal root ganglion on their way to the spinal cord. And so they can be effectively blocked at this location. Secondly, only a fraction of the injected local anesthetic reaches this area, as we see when we're imaging actual patients who receive radio contrast. And while much of the local anesthetic stays within the muscle, a small but significant proportion does make its way into the intervertebral foraminal areas. The resulting low concentration and mass of local anesthetic that acts on these neurons and the dorsal root ganglion and spinal nerve in those intervertebral foraminal areas manifests itself as differential neural blockade. And this is the result of two facts. First, that conduction block of nerve fibers is not an all or none phenomenon, but is rather proportional to the concentration of local anesthetic reaching the neurons. And we're all familiar with this in terms of block onset or soak time. The second fact is that different nerve fiber types have different sensitivities to local anesthetic conduction block, with the small unmyelinated fibers exhibiting the greatest sensitivity. What this means in practice is that pain relief can indeed be obtained without losing all cutaneous sensation. And in fact, differential blockade is not a new concept having been demonstrated in the 80s during our period of research into epidural analgesia, but it's been largely overlooked since then because it's nowadays only seen during peripheral nerve blocks during that onset phase. Most of us at some point have reassured patients undergoing surgery with local or regional anesthesia with the words, don't worry, you may feel some pressure, but you won't feel pain. And it's also why studies differentiate between anesthesia and analgesia when assessing the onset and success of peripheral nerve blocks. Now, sensory loss usually progresses as the local anesthetic diffuses through the tissues and nerves with increasing concentration. But if the concentration remains low, as may happen in fascial plane blocks in the ESP block, then the pattern of differential sensory block will persist. And I accept that this can be frustrating for many of us who are used to assessing block success or failure by the presence or absence of cutaneous sensory loss or a complete absence of pain rather than an incomplete reduction to tolerable levels. But this is one example of what I referred to at the beginning of the talk about the discomfort that comes with having our established worldviews challenged. Now, interestingly enough, there seems to be a greater willingness to believe in analgesic properties of systemically absorbed plasma-borne local anesthetic. What we do know at this time is that there is rapid and significant uptake of local anesthetic after ESP blocks 
and that these produce plasma concentrations in the range that is associated with therapeutic intravenous lidocaine infusion. These levels can also be sustained with continuous catheter infusions. But at the same time, the evidence for a meaningful analgesic effect is acknowledged in that latest Cochrane review on IV lidocaine infusion is not actually that robust. And my personal opinion, elaborated on in more detail in a recent review article, is that a systemic effect is certainly a plausible contributor to the effect of ESP and other fascial plane blocks. But I think it's likely to be a secondary contributor at best, since the concentrations are at the low end of the therapeutic range and certainly not sustained with single injection blocks. You could also ask the question, why do people gravitate to IV lidocaine? Why does it find its way into guidelines despite the ambiguity of the evidence? And my own view on this is because it is easy to do and relatively safe. Thus, the benefit-risk ratio is a favorable one. So these are the same arguments that would apply to the ESP and really any fascial plane block. Now the last thought on mechanisms of the ESP block that I'd like to leave you with has to do with its potential to provide visceral analgesia. The ESP block has been successfully used to treat pure visceral pain syndromes, including pain from acute appendicitis prior to surgery, as well as the pain of acute pancreatitis. And in trying to understand this, I was led to re-examine my own knowledge of the visceral, pull, of the visceral pain pathway and it turns out that visceral pain is not a sympathetically mediated phenomenon per se, but rather that the sensory afferents from viscera travel with sympathetic efferents in the same anatomical nerves and plexi, which is why a so-called sympathetic block like a celiac plexus block relieves abdominal cancer pain, for example. And so the only place where local anesthetic from an ESP block could exert an effect on visceral pain is at the dorsal root ganglion and spinal nerve where the visceral sensory afferents converge with the somatic sensory afferents that are carried in the intercostal nerves and ventral rami. And I think this thus lends further support to the theory that there is local anesthetic penetrance and effect in that proximal paravertebral space. Some might say that perhaps systemic local anesthetic absorption explains this, but again, I don't believe it's a primary mechanism as we have not seen similar reports of profound analgesia in say acute pancreatitis with intravenous lidocaine infusion. At the end of the day though, when it comes to deciding if this is a useful block or not, how the ESP block works is not as important as a question of whether it works. The proof, as they say, is in the pudding. And right now in 2021, the vast majority of the evidence points to the answer being yes. Numerous RCTs and systematic reviews demonstrate that ESP blocks produce statistically significant improvements across a wide range of different surgeries in various analgesic outcomes, including opiate consumption, resting and dynamic pain scores, and opioid-related side effects. But the clinical importance of analgesia conferred by the ESP block goes beyond just pain scores and opiate consumption in the early postoperative period. It's gratifying to see that many studies have also demonstrated a corresponding reduction in the incidence of nausea and vomiting and it's also encouraging to see that the publication of RCTs reporting quality of recovery scores, either QR40 or QR15, is increasing. Here, for example, is data from a study in breast cancer patients. And we can see that even though pain scores are relatively low in the control group, they're even lower in the ESP group. Furthermore, although the pain scores tend to converge by 24 hours, patients nevertheless report higher quality of recovery scores at the 24-hour interval. Similar results were seen when ESP blocks are used in lumbar spine surgery, where we previously have not had good options for regional analgesia. And this example from Professor Donald Buggy's group in Dublin is just one of the many RCTs that have been published in the last year. And like almost all of them, there were lower pain scores and opioid use up to 24 hours. While naysayers might again dispute the magnitude of these differences, just as we saw with the breast cancer study, there was a clinically meaningful difference in quality of recovery scores at 24 hours. What I found especially illuminating though was the reporting of scores for the individual questions. And these are rated on the zero to 10 scale with zero being bad and 10 being good. Here are the elements for which the statistically significant differences were found. And I think we can all agree that they are very important and meaningful patient-centered outcomes, especially this one and all are clearly impacted by the quality of analgesia. Similar work on quality of recovery scores has also been done in video-assisted thoracic surgery or VATS, and not surprisingly, the addition of an ESP block improves quality of recovery scores compared to placebo, 
even up to 48 hours after surgery. The ESP block also appears to provide similar quality of recovery compared to thoracic paravertebral blocks. And finally, Professor Buggy's group has just published results from a comparative trial of the ESP and serratus anterior plane block. And they found that the ESP block resulted in superior quality of recovery scores. All of the observed differences exceed the accepted MCIDs for the QR scores in question. So I think we can safely say that the ESP block as a regional anesthesia technique does offer clinical value. But there are other important reasons for the ESP block's popularity, namely that it's simpler and safer than some of the alternatives, chiefly thoracic paravertebral blocks and epidurals. Now, at least one study illustrated here has shown that the learning curve and associated success rate for ESP blocks is superior to that of thoracic paravertebral blocks, at least in the hands of inexperienced practitioners. These authors found that less explicit guidance was required to complete the block, and the ESP block was thus also faster to perform, with both of them providing equal analgesic benefit. And apart from minor episodes of local anesthetic systemic toxicity, no serious complications have been reported with any frequency after ESP blocks. In particular, the risk of neural injury or bleeding complications is minor. Adverse events related to central or sympathetic block is possible, but very rare, and in fact, is the trade-off that comes with increased nociceptive blockade and efficacy. I'd also like to point out here that the single report of pneumothorax after ESP block was from a now discredited researcher, and I still maintain that the risk of this particular complication is negligible. And despite headlines to the contrary, I do believe that simplicity and safety are not advantages to be dismissed lightly. Regional anesthesia is still underutilized despite ultrasound guidance, as this database analysis from the US shows. Between 2010 and 2015, only 3% of operations that were amenable to regional anesthesia actually received the block. There are many reasons for this, but a perennial one is that many practitioners just aren't comfortable performing regional anesthesia, often because they didn't receive adequate training or just don't feel comfortable teaching themselves. This survey of French anesthesiologists illustrates it well. The perceived risk and complexity of epidurals and paravertebrals were the greatest obstacles to their use in thoracic surgery. Anything that we can do, therefore, to make regional anesthesia less daunting, both in terms of technical difficulty and risk, will increase the accessibility and applicability of regional anesthesia to the benefit of greater numbers of our patients. And as an example, the ESP block has found its way into many management algorithms worldwide for analgesia after rib fractures. And this is not because it's necessarily the most effective technique, but because one, it is better than no regional anesthesia at all in terms of opioid sparing and pain relief. And two, more importantly perhaps, it can be employed by the vast majority of practitioners who might be called upon to provide acute care to these patients. And the relative simplicity and safety of the ESP block has also allowed its utilization to extend beyond anesthesia in the operating room to emergency departments and out of hospital settings. This includes trauma care and medical care in austere environments, but also management of challenging pain issues for which no good solution exists, such as acute pancreatitis, which I've already mentioned. And it's not just anesthetists performing these in the emergency department, but emergency physicians themselves which further increases the reach of regional anesthesia in improving patient care and outcomes. Perhaps the only note of caution at this point is that we need to ensure that the enthusiasm for the ESP block does not lead us to neglect more advanced regional anesthesia techniques that might serve certain patients better. And the choice here, I think, often depends on where you believe the threshold for acceptable or good enough analgesia lies and the trade-off that you're willing to make. I do believe that there are certain operations and patients where a thoracic epidural or paravertebral block would be a better choice. But if we don't continue to invest in the training and resources required to make these accessible and feasible, they will unfortunately die a natural death. And I'm somewhat conflicted over this issue as I personally believe in being as versatile and competent as possible. But at the same time, this may not be possible for the majority of our colleagues who only occasionally practice regional anesthesia. If we accept that you might have to choose just one over the others, the question of how the ESP block compares to thoracic paravertebrals and epidurals is a relevant one. The limitations of time prevent me from giving much more than a general and sweeping overview of the evidence. But so far, it appears that any advantage in efficacy that paravertebrals or thoracic epidurals have over ESP blocks 
may not actually be that significant. Once again, this judgment needs to be taken in context of both surgery type and patient factors. But here's what we have so far. With regard to breast surgery, several systematic reviews that have reported that there are no statistically significant differences between ESP blocks and paravertebral blocks. And this holds even when an attempt was made to filter out studies of lower quality, as was done by Sadawi and colleagues, who are more skeptics rather than enthusiasts with regard to the ESP. An important point that they have made is that the specifics of the technique are important. It's important that we compare like with like, that is, single injection ESP versus single injection paravertebral blocks. Those RCTs that suggested superiority of the paravertebrals utilize a multiple injection technique and compare that with single injection ESP blocks. So the finding of superiority is not surprising given that this would also be true if you were to compare multiple injection and single injection paravertebral blocks. In thoracic surgery, it's a similar story. If you compare the two techniques performed with the same number of injections, the RCT data indicates that they provide comparative analgesia for VATS. But the ESP block appears to offer advantages with regard to hemodynamic stability and shorter block performance time. Now, this very recent systematic review pooled the data from the four available RCTs comparing ESP and paravertebral blocks, and they did find a statistically significant difference in pain scores and 24-hour opioid consumption in favor of the paravertebral groups. But it's worth noting that they included the trials that in compared a multiple injection paravertebral with a single injection ESP. In the discussion, however, the authors raised the question of whether these differences were indeed clinically meaningful when balanced against the technical demands and risks of a paravertebral. Ultimately, I think this is a decision that needs to be taken on an individual basis. As a pragmatist, I would say that if you can do paravertebrals, then you should. But if you can't for any reason, then ESP blocks are an excellent alternative in VATS. And this is underscored by the fact that quality of recovery scores appear to be similar, as I've previously mentioned. Now, we have much less evidence for thoracic epidurals versus ESP blocks, unfortunately, but the single RCT that's currently available from the cardiac surgery literature indicates that continuous ESP blocks are a viable alternative, and one that's associated with less risk of hypotension as well as other adverse effects. Other case series and reports also support ESP catheters as an alternative to epidurals. Here, I think the choice is very much determined by the relative risk profile and contraindications. The ESP blocks have a much wider scope of application as a result compared to epidurals, especially when it comes to cardiac surgery and the anticoagulation issues involved. The picture in abdominal surgery is unfortunately a little bit more complicated and less clear. And this is because there are many more different permutations of surgery types, of incisions, of alternative blocks that could be performed, and differences in innovation of different portions of the abdominal wall. A full discussion of the considerations in decision-making would require another lecturing entirely. But nevertheless, the ESP block does, in my view, have some theoretical advantages. It's performed away from the surgical field, and its more proximal site of action means that it will block lateral branches of the intercostal nerves so it may be useful in excisions extending towards the anterior or mid-axillary line. It can also be targeted to cover the desired thoracoabdominal nerves, which is especially important for supraumbilical incisions, which are not always reached by the other blocks. In addition, depending on the type of operation, there will be a varying amount of visceral pain from internal organ injury and inflammation. And the RCTs currently available do indicate that ESP blocks can provide effective analgesia especially if continuous catheter techniques are used. In conclusion though, it's my opinion that the simplistic dichotomy of friend versus foe isn't really relevant or helpful. The ESP block I think is undoubtedly a valuable advance in the practice of regional anesthesia and is here to stay. For the reasons that it works well enough most of the time, is within the capabilities and comfort zone of most practitioners, and is highly versatile in the situations and patients to which can be applied. As with any tool or technique, the real trick is in knowing when and where to use it. Thank you.